Welcome to the RV Podcast. This is episode 426, and this week we're going to talk about, have you ever thought about being a host at a campground? Well, we're going to answer that question for you. How to be a campground host. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendland. This is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. Hello, my dear. Hello, Michael. And we are glad to have you guys with us today. Just a quick note, uh, detailed program notes on everything that we talk about today. Uh, All the links, uh, all the resources that we will reference in this episode can be found on our travel blog, rvlifestyle.com. Just go to rvlifestyle.com and uh, you'll find uh, this uh, podcast prominently featured. There's even a little tab there so you can listen to the podcasts or uh, check other ones and all the notes and stuff we talk about. So please check that out. And uh, may we suggest, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our RV podcast. And we're on all the different uh, podcast apps. And when you subscribe, you'll automatically, on your smartphone or your tablet, Get we'll a show notification. Up. We'll show You're up. You're going to know that yeah. we're out there. And um, to help us have more people know about the RV podcast, if you would leave us a review, we'd appreciate it. We love seeing those five star reviews. And what about if they're not so happy? If they're not so happy, uh, never mind. Just, Just move uh, on. They can move on. But uh, seriously, a big thanks to all of our subscribers and all of you who have uh, shared good things about this podcast on your social media circles. We really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. And can you believe it? Christmas is almost here. I just can't believe it. And then, you know, it comes after Christmas is New Year's. And uh, this year is almost toast. It is. Now, uh, December uh, is the slowest RV travel month in the year. And it's a month that uh, Jen and I mark off on our calendars. Uh, For one thing, we are here from Thanksgiving to Christmas because we like to be with family and friends. But for another one, uh, because we travel half to three quarters of the time most years, we use December to do as many of our annual medical checkups. Maintenance. (laughs) Yeah, human maintenance is what Jennifer calls it. Uh, And uh, it's it's been great. We don't usually travel, but... It's been a little different for us this year, as you know. We we uh, recently shared that we bought 10 acres of property in southwest Michigan. This is Michigan. It's over here. And we live. We live over here. here. So we used we are, to live up there, but then <laughs> <laughs> don't confuse them. We're, Mike would really like to go live up here. So we crossed the state. Yeah, I like to be up. He'd up like here, to be but, in the UP. But anyway, we crossed the state, uh, and there's a house there that we're renovating, and so we've been camping there on and off uh, quite a bit uh, so far, even uh, even here in December. And we've had snow and it's been cold, but we've been camping there in our RVs and we've been nice and snug and warm and everything's been great. And we usually camp there a night a week. Yeah, and but, we might be camping a couple more nights a week. Yeah. And it's fun to yeah. go over there and camp. We'll probably camp there one night this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have one more trip before the new year to Elkhart, Indiana. We hope to go there uh, this coming week, uh, mm-hmm. we have heard about a couple of new RV models, and we asked the manufacturer, and they agreed to give us a sneak peek. So we're bringing the video cameras, and we're going to uh, tour a couple of new models, and we're going to actually get an exclusive look before they officially unveil them at the Tampa RV Show next month. Um, and then after that, we want to slow down and enjoy the holiday season Uh, for a couple of weeks with family and friends. And we are really looking forward to getting that sneak peek because when you're there, when everything's announced at Tampa, it's so crowded and so busy. And this was part of our thinking of moving closer to Elkhart, that maybe we could get more sneak peeks and be able to tell you all about what's coming. Now, those of you listening, I'm showing up my hand, you know, the Michigan mitt, but, uh, and I'm showing where Southwest Michigan is over, you know, uh, beneath the knuckle of the uh, of the little finger <laughs> on your left hand. Uh, Elkhart is just down at the border, just maybe, you know, 50, 60 miles from us. So we can get to Elkhart very easily when we are uh, on our property in, uh, in west, southwestern Michigan. So. And I was surprised how many people who work in Elkhart at the RV manufacturing different things live in southern Michigan. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we, we think we'll get a little bit more attuned to what's going on 
at the RV capital of the world, which is Elkhart. So that's great. Hey, we have a comment this week that we want to pass along. Uh, and then we'll get into our interview of the week uh, after a quick break. But th this comment comes, uh, and I was delighted to see this because it's something that we have come to realize personally. Uh, now that we tow a fifth wheel, besides driving in our Class C motorhome, we have become acutely aware of speed. And uh, we've shared before that uh, we think, now maybe this is just a mark of being on the road too much, but people don't you think people are driving crazier? Yeah, they are. There's more weaving in and out. I don't know if it's because of driver's ed classes. They don't you know, have them not anymore. As the way they used to be. Yeah. Anyway, this comment came from one of our followers named Ed, and uh, I think we should share it. All right. I'll, I'm going to share what Ed sent to us. I am a recently retired highway patrolman, and as a law enforcement officer, I saw more than my share of accidents and many involving RVs. Now, as an RVer myself, I see so many RVers out there driving way too fast. Never should you drive over 70. In fact, my advice is between 60 and 65. Yes, you will be passed, and you may feel you want to go faster, but don't especially if you are towing. We tow a 35-foot fifth wheel, and I never drive more than 62. I put the speed control on that and leave it that, at that. I do that because of my experience as a cop and how I personally saw many more times than what I ever want to remember or see the, that excessive speed in RVs can result in catastrophic accidents. Consider this a public service announcement from someone who knows. Well, we thank Ed for uh, sharing that. And uh, it's hard, you know, because everybody's going 90 to 100 miles an hour, honest to goodness, on the, on the interstate. And you tend to think maybe you're a hazard because you're driving slow, you know, but you're not. In fact, when we got our fifth wheel, the first question I ask is, what speed should we drive at? And that was, we took uh, a drive, Jim and I both took a, a driving school uh, mm -hmm. class, and that was the first thing we asked. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know, and they said 65, that's it. That's the fastest no faster you than, should go. No faster than 65. Yeah, and the reason why, particularly if you tow, is, you know, it doesn't take much of a sway, uh, as particularly on cold or wet roads, for it to lose control. Um, but even motorhomes, you know, they're so much heavier. It takes longer to stop. Um, they're easier to lose, easier to lose control of. But uh, they're more susceptible to you losing control the faster you go. So I thank Ed for saying that. I mean, he saw the results of too much speed with RVs, and I hope you all listen to and it. And I, I think all of you will agree about cars that weave in and out and go excessively fast. They they're shouldn't nuts. be fast. What about the trucks? Have you noticed that there's, it seems like there's more trucks now. There are main, well, we're that are trying going to catch up faster with that. than they really should. It used yeah. to be trucks never did this, that, or the other, and I think there's a lot of new drivers out there. I think there are a lot of new drivers, um, a lot of foreign drivers. Yep, uh, they don't know the rules. We've had a couple of emails from truck drivers who've explained it, and we welcome more if you're a professional truck driver. What's up with some of the truck drivers? Because some of them are driving way too... I mean, we've been passed by them going 80 miles an hour. Not down hills, but on straightaways. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, go slow. I go off topic, sorry. <laughs> no, that's very much the topic. So we thank Ed for sharing that, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, too, on it. When we come back, we're going to talk about um, a job that, if you've been RVing for any length of time, you've considered you've thought about this. how to be a campground host. We've even thought about this. We have. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Going right back after this. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds and competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. It was for Jen and me. We bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee, in an incredible collection of mountaintop RV properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are 5 to 62 acre properties that allow RVs year-round starting at $79,900. And we loved it. The scenery is breathtaking and you can own it outright. It's not a timeshare. It's your property, your way. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to. There's high-speed internet 
and it's so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations, ready whenever you want. And they're selling these properties by appointment, five to 62 acres, $79,900. Financing, big discounts available on multi-lot packages. For information, visit myrvland.com, myrvland.com. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's time now for our interview of the week. And this is with a couple who have been uh, friends of ours now for a few years, and they are um, full-time RVers. And it's Eric and Jean Anderson. They travel along with their, their dog, Hershey Pup. Hershey Pup. That's a cute name. It's a well-traveled puppy. And they spent the last two and a half years traveling, RVing, all through the lower 48 states and six Canadian provinces. And they've driven more than 27,000 miles and shared much of their adventure in photos on our Facebook group. RV Lifestyle Facebook group. They mm -hmm. are, are regular contributors to it. Well, uh, we caught up with Eric and Jean um, because during this time of year, uh, they have decided to accept a volunteer campground host assignment. Uh, they're going to be doing that at a place called Killens Pond State Park that's in Felton, Delaware. Uh, a perk of the job for them is just 30 miles from... Uh, their uh, two granddaughters. <laughs> well, that'll do it. That'll sway them. Yeah. And, and so we get so many questions from people. They're just wondering what's involved. You know, do they have to clean fire pits. They have to clean toilets. They have to greet people. What exactly are your responsibilities when you do this? And so uh, wondering if the best thing about these jobs is stretching their travel dollar, making your money go just a little bit farther, getting to see parts of the country that you wouldn't normally get to see. So we thought it would be fun to talk to Eric and Jean about what led them to uh, try this out. And specifically, how they found the job and how, if that's something you're interested, you can too. And we'll have links, as we said, on our podcast note to all the information that they share with us today. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Eric and Jean Anderson about how to become a campground volunteer host. Well, joining us right now is Eric Anderson and his wife, Jean. And um, you guys have been on before, but it's always good to see you. And look at all the festive holiday lights behind you. Merry <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. Good to see you, Mike. Yeah. You guys are in uh, Miramar Beach, Florida, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. where we are. That's great. Well, that's a particularly great time of year to be down there. Well, today we want to talk a little bit uh, on the expertise that you have required have acquired about being a camp host. And the reason, uh, and I know you start doing that later this year, but one of the things you both are known for is that the meticulous planning and research you have done on your travels. I know it's there in particular, yeah. but, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm being... You know, but but you guys have been everywhere. It, uh, how many states now? We've covered the lower 48 states as of October and okay. six Canadian provinces too. Yep. S something like 27,000 miles you have driven. And uh, and I know we were talking earlier this year, uh, earlier this month, you, you're even, you've, you're getting 2023 all planned out. And, and I bet you're even on to 24, so... Well, uh, we have some ideas going out there, yeah. Yeah, well, so when it came to this idea of being a camp host, this is the time of year that we get a lot of requests from people for information about it, and uh, you are the perfect guest to have. So so let's talk about that. Um, one, for those who are unfamiliar, what exactly is a camp host? What, what does that involve? Okay, okay sure. Well, uh, camp host or campground host, um, typically it's going to be in like a national state park or other municipal public type of park setting. And uh, the camp hosts um, are just that host. You know, they're there to, to greet campers, uh, to do check in and check out type processes, be an ambassador um, to the park and, and the agency. And, um, and, and typically it's a volunteer position but a number of perks and benefits come with it, which is part of the reason why we want yeah, to do it. Free um, camping. Free, yeah. A free site with free hookups and uh, different perks and benefits that come along with that. And uh, really an opportunity to interact with the, the campground visitors and uh, give them the best camping experience at the park that they can have. Keep the yeah. area clean. 
keep the area clean um, and just make sure that, you know, the rules are in place. But we were told to just uh, not get involved, too involved in keeping um, enforcement. Enforcement. Yeah. yeah. If something yeah. goes wrong and you don't feel and you're not really capable of keeping things too involved, just call them or what do they call the rangers, rangers that they, yeah. they'll take care of the hard stuff well first question after all this is uh besides those perks which you mentioned but after all your years of exploring and adventuring and traveling uh this is going to have you static for a while a little longer mm -hmm. than you normally are uh, Six months, what, yeah. what caused you to that? I mean, that's a big switch from being truly nomads traveling all 48 states to campus. What, Gene, start off. What, what were the reasons okay. why? Um, well, we were looking, uh, you know, we knew that we were coming close to an end of, you know, traveling constantly. And we were looking for places. We, you know, we looked at places. We went to Utah and we were like, oh, this would be a beautiful place to camp host. But the reason we picked Delaware was, I have to say, my son is there, my beautiful daughter-in-law, and um, our, our two grandchildren. And mm -hmm. so we just decided, we picked a couple of places, and the first one was, of course, um, Delaware, because of family was there. So we just came from mm -hmm. visiting my son, and um, there was three parks that we were going to go look at. And we were lucky enough to actually be able to look around and not too many people can do this you have to kind of just see it and and go by uh you know not actually seeing it so we had gone to three of the parks one was right on the beach no shade whatsoever and um so we were thinking oh this will be cool this will be great you know and then we realized mm, not maybe you know it would just be complete sun sand all so but we were told that that park wasn't available and then we went to is it killing killing killing's pond killing's pond uh park and we went there and it really was beautiful it had shade it had so we got to check out all the different parks and at first we thought the beach would be fun but then for six months with you know constant sun constant sand we thought oh maybe that wouldn't be so great it turned out it wasn't available anyway and when we went to killen's pond it seemed a lot more um uh, inviting for us and there was a uh it, availability was there so um luckily we got to pick and see what was available and uh it's only half an hour away from my son mm -hmm. and my grandchildren and um we just uh mm -hmm. applied for it but yeah to, to your point mike you know we, we were traveling at quite a pace over the past two years we really wanted to kind of slow things down a little bit um and an opportunity to save save some money as well so have you done any calculations about uh how much you'll really save to here if you have any f yeah. figures on that um, absolutely matter of fact that's one of our motivations for sign of slowing it down a bit for uh for next year is to save some money you know uh, keep some more in our bank account mm -hmm. and uh yeah it was an expensive year to travel especially with fuel costs as, as everybody's been talking about when we were paying seven dollars a gallon in uh, california <laughs> So I figured for all of our travels from April to October this year, we spent about seven thousand four hundred dollars just in gas, just in fuel. Yeah, mm -hmm. just in fuel. So that was pretty significant. And um, so I figure that you know, with us sitting still doing the camp hosting, we're going to save probably a, a good five thousand dollars in in fuel for that period of time. And then when we figure our average, our nightly average, because we do a lot of state parks, COEs, uh, boondocking and dry camping, you know, our average is around $32 a night for, for our camping fees. So when I factor that in, I figure we're going to save probably another good five, at least $5,000 in terms of fees. So, so if we stick it out through this whole six month period next summer, and we could save a good, I think at least $10,000 and that's uh substantial yeah that's fair yeah mm -hmm. absolutely and you're still doing the rv lifestyle you're in a great spot and you're near the grandkids yeah. yep there we go so uh so that's why we decided to kind of slow down a bit um it's I, i'm a little more leery about it than genie is i think she's really looking forward to it but i'm a little worried i'm going to be getting getting itchy to, to to move again too soon so we'll see how that goes yeah we you know we'll just uh what have you when you did your research did you talk to other 
camp hosts? And if so, did they tell you what to look for and what to avoid besides things like too much sun and, and no shade, stuff like that? Oh, that sounds crazy, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, Cause I, I think, as you know, state parks, county parks, you know, COE parks, those are kind of our favorites, you know? So we've stayed in a lot of state parks and kind of made a habit of, of seeking out the camp posts and chatting them up a bit and seeing uh, how they like their assignments, how long they've been doing it, what, what they enjoyed, what they didn't enjoy, and, and trying to get advice as well from all the camp posts that, that we met around the country. So that, that was very helpful. Now, how did you, you pick Delaware because it was close to family and, and you actually visited the sites. Um, how, what's the application process in becoming a camp host uh, for people who say, hey, I'd like to do that? Um, walk them through, give them some suggestions based on your research and the way you guys did it. Okay, sure. There's, um, well, in terms of starting to do the research, um, most state websites and state park websites have like a volunteer section to it. Um, you can follow a couple of links to get into the, the volunteer opportunities, and that's a great place to start. Um, then there's some, some other places too, like volunteer.gov has many listings for camp hosting positions around the country. Why don't and, you give uh, that site again? That was that yep. site. Volunteer.gov. Volunteer.gov. Got it. Yep. yep. Got a lot. Um, and then we also have a subscription to work camper news. Mm -hmm. And so work camper news, uh, along with paid type of uh, work camping situations also has volunteer camp post opportunities as well. So that's where we got a lot of our initial information. That's where you can do it if uh, online. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. we were lucky. We got a chance yeah. to actually visit the parks. Not everybody yeah. can do it. So those but, places are how you can start online. Right, right. But I think most of the application processes these days is, is online. And in fact, for Delaware State Parks, that's what we were told to do was to go online. We had to submit a separate application for both Jeannie and myself. Um, and it was fairly comprehensive, asked a lot of questions, had some essay questions in there, yeah. you know, where we had to actually write, you know, about, you know, why we wanted to be camp hosts and why we felt that, um, you know, what qualities we had would make us good camp hosts and, and why. Um, but it was a fairly easy mm -hmm. online process. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so, so you got this job, uh, other than visiting the site to see, but pretty much sight unseen, not having to deal, going to an office or a, it's all yeah. just done. Correct. And, and I think that's probably the way the majority of folks do get their camp hosting positions because they may be uh, in Florida, but they want to do camp hosting in Montana or Colorado or something. And so it's typically online like that. You know, we just seize the opportunity because we happen to be there in Delaware visiting the kids and the grandkids that we went around to the parks. And, and that was going to be one of my suggestions to folks is that if they happen to be in an area where they think they might like to do a camp hosting assignment someday or the next year, is to really search out the, the camp hosts, the rangers, the, the park manager especially, introduce themselves and, and try to get to know them. Because it's, especially in this digital day and age, and, and I think, you know, I've been in human resources for 32 years, but uh, things have changed a lot. So in this digital age where everything is computerized and, and you don't get that face-to-face yeah, -face interaction. The human contact, yeah. Yeah, and, and it helps you stand out, I think, in, among the competition, you know, because the, uh, the, the park management has, can match a name with a face faces yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, I think that might give you an edge gene was there a lot of competition hmm. uh well um the only place that actually well no it was just the, the well, beach one that yeah, there was just no opening um so somebody yeah, had gotten other, that one yeah uh, the one that had some um availability was killing mm -hmm. uh, so now when did you guys what what month of the year did you get did you apply and, uh, and ask for this job yeah, October? this was back was in early October, like okay. the first week of October. Now, is it too late in December for a job for next uh, next year? Uh, it's definitely not too late, but, but it's probably it's a little bit. Yeah, later. you're getting a little too close. You know, for I the more popular ones, those, I would imagine they, they want to have those parts, positions right. filled by. Uh, I would think. Right. Yeah. So, when would ideally, uh, when would you urge people? to apply uh, for one of these jobs because there is October. competition. Yep. September, October. October. Yeah. Like September and into October, yeah. yeah. Okay. In fact, the, the, uh, the state managers, volunteer managers said that that was the ideal time as well because that's when they really start looking to try to fill for mm -hmm. the next year. But they said they, they always have needs typically and some people back out, they have cancellations. 
So it never hurts to try. Well, I, I'm curious. Have, they, always, they always have the people that were there the year before. Yeah. yeah. So they want that's, to do it first. That's, yeah, that's where the competition yep. gets a little. And how long are you guys going to be camp hosts in Delaware? Six months, did you say? Yeah, yeah. that's a long time. Well, that's the yeah. one thing we're like, oh, you know, three months would yeah. have been yeah. a and little better. And then we could have maybe said, we'll stay another three months. Yeah. But for some, ha- some, reason, some reason, we, we made that commitment. I know, we Hopefully made we that commitment. Bite off more than we could chew. I don't know. And Delaware State Parks, the minimum is, um, three, is three months. months three month commitment. And then they do, I think they do a two, two month probationary review and then they allow you to extend it potentially. Uh, but we just signed up for the whole six months. <laughs> Cause we do things like that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. I would, I would be curious to hear from both of you, what you anticipate you will like the most about this job and the least about this job. You want to start uh, off Gene? Uh, the least cleaning toilets, <laughs> which I didn't realize we were going to do, but that's what we're going to do. Um, the most is just interacting with the, uh, the camp, uh, you know, the, the campers. Mm-hmm. And so that's the most I'm looking forward to. Cause you know, everybody here, everybody, every camper is, you know, on mm-hmm. the same page with us, you know, life is good. You know, we're out camping. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that's the, uh, the best thing I'm looking forward to, um, uh, greeting and meeting the campers and, uh, yeah. Of course, I don't want to clean uh, a bathroom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I wonder who's going to get that job. Eric, best uh, and worst. He's already I, said I, it. I volunteered yeah. to get yeah. out of that. But we so. have to, you know, clean up a lot of you know, the, the campsites, the uh, camp, the cabins. We have to do a lot mm-hmm. of that. So yeah. that'll be okay. And and what about you, Eric? What do you think is the best and worst? Same things? or uh, Pretty much the same. Um, you know, the best part, certainly, I, I'm looking forward to interacting with all the campers and, and the guests. Um, that's one thing that struck us on our travels around is that far too many times we never even saw a camp house host, uh, which I thought was interesting. You know, we could be staying in a state park or something for a week or so, and we may never even seen a camp host. Or if we did see them, they were just, and I know they're working, but they're just tooling along in the golf cart and we hardly ever were greeted or hardly ever camp hosts hardly ever checked in with us to say hello. No interaction. See how things were going. There was yeah. like very much no interaction. Um, so we thought that was kind of odd. And we want to be the kind of camp hosts who really greet people. And I find with Delaware State Parks and materials they gave us, um, they're really big on that. They're big on hospitality and customer service, being an ambassador. And uh, so we're looking forward to yeah. doing it's that. It's not a campers. very big camp. It's not, it only has one bathhouse. So yeah. it's not really going to be overwhelmed. I don't think it'll be overwhelming. Right. It's 70, 73 sites and 11 uh, rental cabins. So and it's not that how, how, how many hours a day do you think that you'll be actually, quote, working Probably as a volunteer? Five. Well, they, yeah, about that. I mean, they require 24 hours per person of a couple per week. Okay. And then if it's an individual, they require a minimum of 30 hours per week. And, and then we'll get the same days off. And in exchange for that, hmm. what what exactly do you get? You mentioned real briefly some of them, but talk about what free, <clears throat> free camping, you know, full full hookup. Full hookup site. Yeah. Um, they now, do have now, a water park. They have a water park there for kids. So we, we we get four free tickets each time. Oh, so that that was biggie. That was real big. Bring, so my grandkids, grandkids could yeah, my grandkids can come and we can yeah. all go to the water park every time. So that's it's really exciting. I don't know anything else. The mm-hmm. full hookup, the free park, yep, uh, uh, but we can go to well, other campgrounds. Uh, free admission to any Delaware State Park during the time we're there as well. Um, discounts for, for purchases and um, and they well, they, they list uniforms as a benefit. I want a picture of you guys in a uniform. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, we should mention that you guys travel with Hershey the Pup. Hershey Park. Uh, Hershey Park. And if, yeah. if, if our followers on Facebook have said, where is Hershey? We Here should look is. at him. Is. Um, oh, Hershey, Hershey is more famous than you. Uniform. There he is. He is. He has Way his more uniform. Famous than us. Hey, Hershey, what's up, bud? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> what's he wearing? He's actually, he's actually already got his uniform. Oh, Camp look house. at that. <laughs> he's so, a good boy. So he's ready to go. Yeah. He is ready to go. Hershey's kind of, I've always said Bo is well-traveled, but Hershey is really well-traveled. Yeah. And uh, if, if people read you guys regularly on our Facebook group, when you post, uh, he's, Hershey's hiked and 
he's been he's everywhere been, and uh he's, well, been, he's, he's he's really is such a good boy he's yeah. such a good boy he, he really is way, way more than a, a cavalier king charles was ever bred to to do yeah really yeah. i think they're supposed we, we, to just sit on someone's yeah. lap yeah. You know? yeah they were bred to uh to just be pampered on the, the laps of kings and queens so we, we don't want him to hear that <laughs> yeah well i think he knows he's kind of a famous pup as it is yeah. Yeah. now i have one question for you both of you because you have traveled so much and clearly enjoyed it um you're going to be in one place for six months uh, um yeah. in a way that's kind of nice i suppose but yeah. on the other hand uh you've been both bitten by the travel bug mm -hmm. have I'm you had serious about discussions about that um probably not as serious as we should have well we're, we're a little nervous we're a yeah. little nervous the only thing that would keep me you know is that i'll see my grandkids and yeah. my son and my daughter-in-law you know that that'll keep me happy yeah. um but like I said, I think we, when we said six months, we were like, why'd we do that? You know, just in case. So we're really just, it all depends on yeah. how things go. We can't really foresee yeah. if we're going to be, you know. We're, we're hoping we really like it. And yeah. It goes now, well. yeah. Uh, on the reverse side of that, and I don't think a lot of people who are full timers, um, we don't hear this part of the, of the t conversation a lot, but after you've traveled as much as you guys have, mm -hmm. um, it becomes wearisome in a sense, doesn't it? This mm -hmm. I, I call it the decision fatigue because every place yeah. is a new place. Mm -hmm. You have to, to make a decision. Okay, where are we going to get, uh, you know, our supplies in the drugstore? Yeah. And I know Eric is the researcher in the group, but still all that becomes a bit tedious, doesn't it? I, yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Along with the excitement and wonder of travel, there is that aspect of it. And it, it wears on you a little bit. And I think it, he said, it has you a little You just said fresh, a, a but... while ago, I can't believe I don't have to make plans. Like I don't have to. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. necessarily happily, though. Yeah. yeah, it, just, yeah. it just feels yeah. strange not to make be making my usual reservations for next summer you know yeah and then now, we're gonna go to you know. then we're going to arizona after that for the yeah. winter so yeah. that's another three six month stay so yeah and then traveling across the country so but it's interesting because these are have you found in all your travelings as you go back and visit it it's like the whole country is your home now because you've yeah, got a yeah, little bit of absolutely and it, uh, we are going back to places we've already visited yeah, and you read really like that That's you really read like. stories about them in the news those places and you feel for them because yep. you remember mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. One, one of the things i think will help though are, and that'll be good about staying in one place for a while is we have a couple of projects that that we're going to start working on that mm -hmm. have been difficult to do when we've been constantly moving moving mm -hmm. moving you know um, you know, we actually, we actually, we're we're starting to write a, a little children's book on Hershey's Grand RV Adventures, and uh, that's going to be kind of like a series. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're going to lose use our downtime to really focus on some of those kind of things. And hopefully, that'll well, help us. Too, period. We can't wait to uh, go with you uh, virtually here as you enter this different phase of the RV lifestyle, and. Uh, We'll uh, we'll uh, urge people they can follow you on uh, you post regularly on our RV Lifestyle Facebook group so we can sit. You tell everybody what you're in. You're in a motorhome, a small Class A motorhome. Yeah, we have we have a Thor Windsport 29M. It's 2017. We're just about 31 feet, and uh, that's been the perfect size for us. Not too it, big, not too small, yeah. and it's worked out well. And we tow our Honda CRV with us and right now you're in florida you've been down there how long are you staying in uh, the panhandle in miramar beach right well we're three months here in the panhandle and, and then, then uh, and well and then uh, then mount dora for a week because we have family there that we'll spend. yeah and then we'll hang out down in uh, key largo we're looking forward to until uh april mid, mid april yeah and when yeah. do you start this new position as camp host uh first first may of may 1st. yeah yeah so we got couple of weeks we'll be traveling up the east coast visiting family and friends and then we'll settle in and be camp hosts well well you know how it goes <laughs> yeah. yeah well i think that there's a lot of folks who would have seriously considered doing this and you've helped uh help them with uh with some of the process questions and uh, uh i think you're going to have a great time 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you. We'll be back down in Florida before you go to Key Largo. And then we'll be in Tampa at the RV show. So we're not too far from you. So uh, we're looking forward, Jennifer and I, to seeing you guys. And Bo looks forward to seeing Hershey. So uh, so we'll look forward to that, too. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Eric and Jean Anderson, our guests. Thank you guys so much. Thank All you. All right. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Take care. Well, you know, you've considered doing that yourself sometimes. So what do you think? I think that it would be fun if you have good health and uh, you want to see the country and, man, the way inflation's hitting everything, this would be a way to do it. We've known several people who've been campground hosts, and they say it is one of the highlights of uh, their RV season. Uh, the big perk, of course, is you usually get your free spot, and usually that spot has full hookups of everything you want, and uh, you get to meet all the people and you stay in one spot. Uh, I don't think I'd like the clean in the bathroom <laughs> part, though. I think that most people who camp are really nice people, and you would meet interesting people. It would be fun. Of course, you know, there's always a couple of lemons in the group, but I think most people you'd enjoy meeting. You know, the one job I really wanted to do was being a volunteer light, lighthouse keeper. Where do we find that? It was up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Lake Superior. That would be really a fun assignment. Oh, Bo would love that. You get White to dress up in, in like a, a, a light <laughs> a housekeeper's uniform. And uh, there's this, it's very sad, and as we'll share again, you can find the links in the show notes, rvlifestyle.com. There are so many different volunteer jobs like that available, and uh, we'll, we'll, we urge you to go to the show notes, rvlifestyle.com, and find them. Anyway, thanks to Eric and Jean, and uh, we look forward to seeing them uh, before they, uh, they take their new assignment uh, in Delaware. When we come back, we've got the RV News of the Week, so stay with us. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborne batteries. Battleborne batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free, and battleborne batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborne battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborne batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. One of the most exciting developments for RVs is happening out west in Arizona. Western Land and Ranches is selling five-acre high-elevation ranches just off the famous Route 66, the birthplace of the American road trip. Prices start at only $39,900, and these are beautiful, secluded tracts of land surrounded by majestic mountain ranges with sweeping valley views. The high elevation is a unique microclimate as well, giving you cooler temperatures, green grasses, and tree cover, making it unique for desert property. The community is in the center of it all, close to the best of the West, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, Lake Havasu, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, the Colorado River, Flagstaff, Sedona, and Historic Williams. If you're tired of crowded RV parks and paying high fees for sites, well, ownership might be right for you. This incredible collection of mountaintop properties called Greenwood Ranches hit the market and it's selling out fast. There is no HOA. You can build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or just RV. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership. Visit the website to get details and set up a showing, ArizonaRVLand.net. That's ArizonaRVLand.net. All right, welcome back, everybody. Time now for our regular feature, the RV News of the Week. And I want to start off with a, a story that I think is interesting. So many people love to visit various hot springs as they travel out west, or where most of them are. In fact, there are a lot of people who do whole RV trips based on soaking in those mm -hmm. natural hot springs. Well, several people who soaked in the hot springs at Utah's Fifth Water Hot Springs at the Spanish Fork Canyon are reporting a really bad rash several days afterwards, causing pain, 
uh, sleepless nights, and even scarring. Uh, the hot springs are in the, uh, I hope I pronounced it right, the Unita Wasquatch Cache National Forest. It's not too far out of Salt Lake City. And one man who suffered a painful rash all over his body for three weeks uh, was later told that it was a type, a unique type of hot tub or swimmer's itch. But apparently, um, this type of swimmer's itch is often caused by parasites in the water that die in the human skin. So it's pretty ugly. We put a link to a story with a lot more information about that that you ought to check out if uh, you're going to go to one of those natural hot tubs and just go to rvlifestyle.com and look in the show notes uh, for the podcast and you'll find it right there. I think it's safe to say they're not going to be adding chemicals to try to control it. No, no chemicals. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm, yeah, Maybe too many people in these springs. I don't know. That's kind of... Don't well, there's some kind of parasite that yeah. got in there, you know? Yeah. yeah. There, that, well, things are out there. All right, the next one, a happy story. You're going to want to get your pencil and paper out. And we'll put this again on the show notes so yeah. you can find it. But. Okay, the National Park Service has announced its five free entrance days for 2023. And they are... Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> January 16th, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Day. April 22nd, the first day of the National Park Week. August 4th, anniversary of the Great American Outdoors Act. September 23rd, National Public Lands Day. And November 11th, Veterans Day. Now, not all of the more than 400 national parks charge an entrance fee, but many of the most popular ones do. On the free days, that charge is waived to encourage more people to come and visit and go to our national parks. So I hope They'll make a point to go to one. Yep. We love our national parks. Uh, interesting story. It comes out of um, California's San Luis Obispo County uh, and uh, Harvest Hosts in that area. Uh, several businesses that are open to Harvest Hosts. Harvest Hosts is a great program that we certainly recommend and use ourselves. Um, several Harvest Hosts businesses in San Luis Obispo uh, found themselves in hot water with the county planning department recently for alleged advertising their properties as a campground without proper permits. Sounds a little bit like overreach because that's not what they are. Uh, the county uh, said that they're concerned about things involving unregulated camping like vegetation catching fire or pollution. And the businesses, including some wineries in that area, tried to explain to the county that that people who stay on their property are not camping in a traditional way. Instead, the guests pay nothing to stay there, but typically buy wine or other products from the farm or whatever it is. Um, they do not have water or sewer hookups. They don't have campfires. They don't do typical camping activities. Instead, they just sleep in their parked vehicle and then usually visit the, the business. Well, the county ended up admitting they don't really have a category for such activity. But um, this is in California, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how this resolves. And we hope that the wineries and uh, any other Harvest Host businesses are allowed to continue operating there. Uh, we'll put a link to that story uh, in the show notes for the podcast. We love Harvest Hosts, and we recommend them frequently. In fact, they have a big end-of-year sale going on, and uh, we'll put a, a link in the show notes where you can get a pretty good discount and other things, so check that all out. Right. So should we have a little pool going? How long is it going to take them to come up with a, a category new category <laughs> for well, Harvest this, Host in California? It is California. <laughs> you know, I, I, well, I'm sorry, the people who live in California. That all live out there. The thinking ones know exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> but the, the reactionary ones are, hey, don't pick on California, but come on, mm -hmm. California's... Well, That's crazy. it's well-meaning. Is it? I, guess, I don't know. You know yeah, we'll give it They want to keep the environment safe and everything, but... Don't mess with Harvest okay. Hosts. <laughs> yeah. Harvest Hosts is yeah. a good thing. All right. Now, for those of you who love winter, you're going to love hearing this. Yellowstone National Park is switched to its winter hours this Thursday, December 15th. That means most park roads will be closed to automobile travel, but snowmobile travel is uh, generally permitted with an approved guide. Weather permitting, the only roads open to vehicles during the winter seasons are the north and northwest entrances. 
All campgrounds are closed in the winter season, which usually lasts until mid-March. Now, so if you like snow, get your snowshoes out, get your cross-country skis, get your snowmobile, well, and uh, I have, there you go. We have always, because we like winter camping, but you can't camp there in the winter, but we've always wanted to go to Yellowstone in the winter, and they have these awesome snowmobile guides that'll take you in on the mm -hmm. park. Um, in fact, you know, we should do that. We, we, oh, that we has talk to be about the, it all the time. That really should be on our bucket list if we could figure a way to do it uh, over but the, the next few months. But the problem is leaving our bow. Oh, my gosh, we'd bow like that. Well, he can't, well, he can't go there. Sand. Well, bow would have to get left, so that's all there is to it. Uh, I have a story from, uh, for those of you who uh, are watching, you know, the Christmas Vacation movie. It's on everybody's list at the holiday time, you know, Cousin Eddie and the Griswolds. There's this Arkansas guy that's uh, that's pretty funny. He is dressed up like Cousin Eddie. He uh, has the, complete with the robe, robe and the big cigar yeah. and uh, the hat. And he has an RV that looks pretty much like the one in the movie. And he's using that look in the RV to collect toys for needy children uh, during the Christmas season for uh, an outfit called the Loaves and Fishes Food Pantry. And uh, it's pretty cool. He's showing up at a parade with this thing, and he's going around. Uh, it was fun, and uh, I am just applauding that. We'll put a link to that story in the show notes, as well as something else, because there are so many uh, fun RV road trip movies out there that we also uh, were thinking about. We made a list of them, and we'll link to that, too, if you want to see it. But uh, Cousin Eddie lives on, and for a good <laughs> cause this time, right? Perfect. All right. Uh, when we come back, we've got uh, RV questions of the week, so please stay with us. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Welcome back. And now it's time for the RV questions of the week. And the first question is from Laura. And Laura's question is, I am thoroughly confused. The spec sheet for the RV I want to buy has both an inverter and a converter. Do I need both? Or are they... Uh, different names for the same device. The salesman at the dealership told me not to worry about them as they do the same thing. And if so, why are there two? Mm. Well, Laura, that's a good catch because that salesman is blowing smoke, um, doesn't know what he's talking about. You do need both. And it's, it's interesting because the terms inverter and converter sound kind of the same. And they both have the same essential function in that they transform power from one form to another, but in exactly opposite ways. And they're essential components. You do need both in your RV. So uh, an inverter uh, is a device that converts direct current, DC electricity, from your RV's batteries, or your coach batteries as they're called, creates DC from the batteries into AC or alternating current. And it's alternating current that runs things like lights and appliances and the motors. Um, and that comes from a DC port source. So it's gotta be turned, converted DC to AC. So that is what inverters do. Now, a converter uh, is a device that transforms AC electricity, the alternating current that you get when you plug your RV into a pedestal at a campground, uh, or shore power as it's called, uh, it converts that AC power that comes out of the pedestal to DC voltage, which then charges your house batteries. So those are the two different functions. 
you need both in your RV. And so uh, your sailor, your, your salesperson sort of just said, hey, it's the uh, same thing, but one's AC to DC and the other's DC to AC. That's the way to think about it. Uh, but you do need both. <laughs> so don't try to cut corners. Don't cut don't corners. Don't try to save yeah. a little bit of money that way. Now for the second question from a follower named Jeffrey. My question concerns an unpleasant subject. I own a 2021 Leisure Wonder Rear Lounge, and I love her. So the issue is, what product do you use to clean and scrub the toilet? I last used Clorox Clinging Bleach Gel. However, I was told that is too strong. Yes, it, it is too strong. Uh, those chemical-based products like, like Clorox and bleach um, are fine for your home cleaning, but RV toilet bowls are very different than uh, home toilets. Now, uh, we always make a deal when we're going through an RV show, and we say, oh, look, boom, 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 porcelain toilets. Well, uh, there are though some major differences. And besides the obvious ones like plumbing and water use, RV toilets are usually made with some additional materials that you don't find in your uh, home toilets. Um, an additional uh, thing is your RV toilet doesn't flush uh, into a septic system. Uh, or city sewage system like at home. So what you use to clean your toilet bowl will also affect the holding, the black tank, the holding tank on your RV. Um, and RV toilet bowls are different than home toilet bowls. Now RV manufacturers are always, con you know this, they're conscious of weight uh, when it comes to building materials and uh, the entirety of most home toilets are made of a, of a thick, heavy porcelain. In fact, it's too heavy to put that, all of that in an RV. So what you see in today's modern RVs containing porcelain bowls, but it's not uncommon. Most, in fact, have completely plastic toilets, uh, even in newer models. So the best type of cleaning, toilet bowl cleaning product for an RV is something, if you can get one that's chemical free, uh, that won't damage that plastic toilet bowl. Uh, and then as it flushes down, it doesn't hurt or interfere with the bacteria colonies in the black tank, which, you know, help uh, digest, I hate to use that word, all of the junk you put in there. Uh, the one that we recommend is called Ultimate RV Toilet Cleaner and Holding Tank Enhancer. And we'll put a link in the uh, show notes for the podcast, Ultimate RV Toilet Cleaner and Holding Tank Enhancer. And the thing about it, it, it kind of adds a boost of breakdown energy for that bacteria in your black tank to help uh, get rid of that stuff, to uh, get rid of that solids that are in there. Um, basically, every time you clean your uh, toilet bowl, you'll also be strengthening that breakdown process in the black tank now, it's not a substitute for the treatment that you flush down the tank, but it does add to its effectiveness. And then the other thing that we should recommend is not using a stiff bristle brush, you know, to clean the RV toilet like you might use at home. Um, we recommend using a silicone toilet brush, and we'll put a link to that as well in the show notes for you. Uh, these brushes do a wonderful job of um, cleaning the surface of the toilet, still soft enough not to cause any damage. And uh, again, specifically, uh, don't use scouring pads of any kind. They cause a lot of damage to the plastic, uh, even the porcelain uh, part of the toilet bowl. So I uh, hope that helped. It is an unpleasant topic. That is such a good question because everybody wants to know for smell and to keep it clean and yeah. sanitary what they should use. And everybody knows what you use at home. You shouldn't use in an RV. That's right. And again, we want to remind you uh, all of the resources and the references of things that we talked about in the podcast uh, are linked in the show notes, uh, rvlifestyle.com. And there's a little tab up at the top which says podcast. You can click on that and you'll, you'll see the show notes. So they're all there. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching. Merry Christmas. Hope you are all having a great time at this special season. And we'll be back next Wednesday with another edition of the RV Podcast. Happy trails. Happy trails.